fact that the Holy Spirit gave the gift of language to the disciples, we're going to do something a little special for the scripture reading today. We've got um, some people who are gifted in other languages, languages other than English, and so we'd like those people to come up to the front right now. They're going to help us with one of the verses. And the rest of you, please stand to hear the word of God. I'll be reading John 14, verses 8 through 17, and also 25 and 26. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do, the thing, will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you may ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Fiddy 做他自己的事Pueden pedir cualquier cosa en mi nombre y la haré. Un vasil bitten, verde der man en nombre, das will ich tun. Si vous demandez quelqu'un choix en mon nom, je le faire. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And then 25 and 26. All of this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Please be seated. I bring you greetings from the North Goshen Mennonite Church. That's where Enid and I are attending. And the scripture reading this morning with uh, four different languages being uh, represented. Each Sunday there, the scripture is read in English and Spanish. It's uh, kind of a neat experience, and it it lets you know that this is a lot bigger than the English-speaking people. It's around the world, and his spirit is alive and well. And Carolyn, it was good to hear your report of what's happening. And when we today were celebrating the Holy Spirit coming and breathing life, into each individual, bringing life into the church. And uh, we each 
find where using our gifts to bring about uh, the message of our Lord Jesus Christ to people around us. Enid and I are going to be using the lectionary for our scripture readings, and that's why this reading was uh, today from, from John and... Uh, and then I will be reading a, just a, a couple verses from Acts. When, I, when Enid and I visited Mark and Lisa Stutzman to celebrate the birth of their son, Sean Morris, it was interesting to see Mark holding his son in his arms. And there was something special about that. It was interesting to see Mark holding Sean, but it was also interesting to see Lisa's, the sparkle in her eyes. And we could tell that there was bonding and love taking place. They will be Sean's advocate and guide, protecting them, protecting him with what he needs to mature and be all that he can be. A little more than a week ago, Nate and Jessica Whitmer Gundy welcomed the birth of their second son, Owen Daniel. And I'm sure the same kind of feeling, the bonding, the attachment that they began to feel to, to him and he to them. In the same way, Wayne and Emily Fennell welcomed Ezekiel Wallace into their family. And they all are beginning to become attached to each other in a special way. Those boys don't understand it, but they are privileged being born and being cuddled and loved by a set of parents. There's such a thing as uh, reactive attachment disorder. It's when a child is born and for three years they really have no one that they can identify as someone who loves and it means that, that uh, they have an absolute detachment which brings about extreme behavior when they have no, uh, when they have the absence of any attachment figure. Now I share that because Jesus was in the process of leaving. He knew he, that he was going, he was leaving. And he wanted to let his disciples know, and that's what in, in John 14, that's the setting for this, uh, for what was read. In John 14, Jesus' words helps to prepare his disciples for his absence by addressing their deepest fears and needs. They have become attached to Jesus. And they want to experience, they, 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 they had no idea, at least, I mean, Jesus was preparing them along the way. But in this setting, he was telling them very forcefully that he's going to be leaving them. And so, Jesus is saying, you know where I'm going and how to get there. But Thomas says, no, we don't know the way. And so then Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
If you had known who I am, then you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And then Philip questions. Lord, show us the Father, and then we will be satisfied. But Philip, Jesus said, Philip, don't you even know who I am? Even after all the time I have been with you. Jesus said, anyone who has seen the Father, the words I say are not my own, but my Father's. He does the work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of what you have seen me do. Thomas and Philip, who had been with Jesus right from the beginning, still didn't quite get it. Jesus had been teaching his disciples all along about who he is, and the final discourse is preparation for Jesus' departure from the world, but he was giving them clues all along. Note in John where it says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. All these passages are from John. And then the the amazing thing is that the promise of verse 12 to 14 points to the future. Jesus must go to the Father before the promise of remarkable works is realized in prayer. It was interesting, Carolyn, as you were talking about how Jesus only had 12. And that's why Jesus is is saying, I need to go back to the Father so that my very spirit can come and dwell in the lives of people, which is a revolution. I'll always remember Jimmy Carter in assembly in Atlanta when he was addressing the Mennonite assembly. He talked about all of us as little Jesuses walking around. And all the Christians, if they, can, if they are filled with God's Spirit, how that would change the world. The truth is, anyone who believes in me will do some works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to the Father. And then it says, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it because the work of the Son brings glory to the Father. You ask anything in my name, I will do it. And then he says in 9, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. And then in verses 15 to 17, the world at large cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But if you do, because he lives in you, will now and later be be in you. And then the last verse that was read, 
was that when the Father sends the Consular as my representative, by the Consular I mean the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I myself have told you. And then we have the happening which all of this is about. That the Holy Spirit was poured out on the, the disciples and they remembered all the stuff that Jesus was telling him, telling them here. And then they began speaking in other languages, and the people who were there were astonished because they were he hearing the good news in their own language. And brothers and sisters, that's the power of that which is in you. Jesus his very self, his very spirit in you. And if we, it, it, it says there, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me. And Jesus said in, verse, in, in, in John 13 that the people will know that I am in you if you love each other. There's many ways in which the Spirit works in our lives. One of the ways that is worked in, our, in the congregation here is that three or four years ago, you did, decided to participate in a habitat and build a, a home for a family. And I was told, I wanted to be here, but I couldn't be here, but I was told of the walls being built out here in uh, the as where the asphalt was and what a joy that was. And someone who, I forget who it was, in their 80s or 90s were pounding nails but somehow you as a body of Christ felt the leading to do that, which is amazing. Somehow that is beyond you, and that's the Spirit of God. And Carolyn, I see the same thing here. You have a, a, a desire within you to teach the good news of Jesus Christ to the people around and you've had that desire ever since I've known you about. And, and that is a beautiful thing. And you don't know, we don't know what all the outcomes will be, but you do it because you want to be faithful. Each morning when we have devotions, Enid and I, we pray that somehow, this day, we will be God's representative wherever we go. And we know that that's possible not because of our own doing, but because of the Spirit, the, Jesus' very Spirit within me. When you go about your work and where you have been called to do your work, that should be your prayer as well, that somehow I will be God's representative this week this day, when I go about what God has, what, what I'm doing, and that somehow people will see Christ in me. We just attended our granddaughter's graduation in West Palm Beach. And the keynote speaker there was Ben Carson. And he was telling everyone there about an, an experience that he had. He was a neurosurgeon. And he said, life was beginning to be kind of mundane. And I began wondering, what would be the new thing for me? 
And he said that was several years after he had started, and, and he was beginning to look at what could be the new thing for him. And then he was reading an article about Siamese twins and how doctors have been struggling with separating Siamese twins because they'd have to determine which one of the Siamese twins is going to die. And so he began doing research about what could, they, could be done so that they could save them both. And he questioned other doctors in, uh, he, he found out that the problem was that they would, one would bleed to death and they couldn't, couldn't control the bleeding. And so he said about, it was about a month later, or I wasn't, I'm not sure how long, but he, be, he began, he, he heard that there was Siamese twins that were born and the parents didn't want to choose which one would die. And they were asking if there's anybody who would be willing to separate them and try to save them both. And you know the history of that, is that Ben Carson decided, he developed a team, and they decided to attempt this surgery, and they were successful. The mother did not, and the father didn't want to choose which one would die. And then he was telling the graduates, what made me begin to research? And he said, it's none other than God's spirit within me. And it wasn't me, but God in me. And he was telling the graduates to keep looking for God's spirit within them and you can do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine because God is within you and will see it through for you. I pray that our words, our deeds here at Oak Grove will be an example to the people around us that we work with, that they will see Christ in you Amen.